Hey, family and friends, I am so glad that you are watching today. I want to welcome uh, all our online audience. I want to welcome our campuses and a big shout out to Pomona. And uh, thank you. Thank you for your faithfulness um, to um, watch the program and your financial support, uh, especially if you're the online audience, um, because if you're being fed every week and, um, you know, this is ministering life to you, then I want to just thank you for supporting uh, us uh, through your gifts of generosity. That means a lot. I'm going to pray, and we're going to get into this message. Thank you. Father, I thank you so much for who you are. You make all the difference in the world. Father, on one side, it seems as though it's the worst of times. On the other side, in our spirits of faith and expectation, it would seem like it's the best of times. And there's a merger in the spirit realm uh, in time that's about ready to happen, oh God. And it's a, an amazing clash that is about ready to take place, oh God, where uh, the darkness of this world will see the true manifestation of the power and the light of God. And I just thank you that we want to be in the middle of that. We don't want it to pass us by. We don't want to miss out. So speak to us today in Jesus' name, amen. Men. I'm going to read you a scripture. It's found in Mark, the second chapter. And Pastor Adam has done an amazing job over the last couple of weeks ministering on new wine and, and what newness represents and uh, how the old things in our lives have to pass away. And last week he talked about a new friend. And here's the passage I want to look at, the Mark translation. It says, Jesus replied, do wedding guests fast while celebrating with the bridegroom? Of course not. They can't fast while the groom is with them. This is speaking of Jesus. He was giving this analogy. He was with them. He says, and the groom was with them, but someday the groom will be taken away. That was speaking of Christ after his death, he would be taken away from them, and then they would fast. But then it goes on and says, besides, who would patch old clothing with new cloth for that new patch will shrink and rip away from the old cloth, leaving even a bigger tear than before. Then it goes on, and this is really what Pastor Adam has been preaching on. And when I saw, heard the amazing message, I said, I'm going to preach kind of the A part. He talked about the new wine and the old wineskins. I'm going to talk about uh, the new cloth versus the old cloth. And so it says, no new wine puts into, uh, excuse me, no one puts new wine into an old wineskin for the wine will burst the wine skin, and the wine and the skins will both be lost. New wine, new wine calls for new wine skins. If you want a new life, you want new changes, then you're going to have to make a difference in your environments and your surroundings. That's what we want to talk about today as we enter into today's message. I, I just love the word new. Uh, all through the word of God, as we looked at uh, over the last couple of weeks, the Bible speaks about a new heaven, a new earth, that we are new creations in Christ Jesus. It talks about a new song. It talks about new beginnings. There's so many words that go along with new. The Bible loves new. You know what? Uh, more than 28 years ago, 29 years ago, a word of newness was spoken to launch and birth this ministry. It's found in Isaiah 43 and in verse number 18 and 19, it says this, Remember ye not the former things, neither consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing, saith the Lord, and I'll make a way in your wilderness and rivers in your deserts. I was at, in January of 1994, at a big O tire place. About ready to put tires on uh, my pastor's car. And uh, I had a little book with the scriptures in it, and I, this scripture jumped off the page. I had been in that ministry now 15 years, nine years full-time as a pastor, and this scripture spoke to me about God was about ready to do something new in my life. Somewhere where I was comfortable, somewhere I thought I, I, I wasn't going to change, thought it was going to be a lifetime being there. 
uh, he said, remember ye not the former things, and I was going to do a new thing. So I, I love this word new because it spoke into the existence of this church, and it wouldn't be here if it wasn't for that. I want you to think about the word new in a different way. Because new is a disruptor. And new, the word, when God does something new, new is an irritator. If you look at the examples of the cloth and you look at the example of the wine, it's a disruptor. It's an irritant. It's friction against that which is old in our lives, that which is stuck in our lives, that which is stale in our lives, that which is stagnant in our lives, and that which is stiff in our lives. Any area of our life that's hard and dry and unproductive. God wants to bring newness into our lives and that's a disruptor and people don't want to be disrupted. And that's going to be an irritant and people don't want to be, an, be irritated. And it's going to cause friction. See, I was about ready to leave a church. I was about ready to leave an income. I was about ready to leave a, a, a position to go do something brand new. That was a disruptor in my life. That was an irritant in my life. That was a friction into my life to my comfortability. And so many people need something new in their life. Or I'm going to use another word. They need something fresh. It's, it's like a soda. It's lost its fizzle. There's no more fizzle in it anymore. And that really describes a lot of people here today that are listening to me today, whether you're on the line or you're in our campus, come on, shout me down. Emoji, say amen. But here's the reality. God's ready to do something new in your life, and he wants there to be freshness into your life for that which is stale in your life, a bad odor in your life. When was the last time you had a fresh revelation, a fresh visitation? Some of us need some fresh prayers, some fresh Bible reading in our lives. Some of us need some fresh attitudes in our lives. Some of us need some fresh friends in our lives. Some of us need some fresh disciplines in our lives because everything has gotten old and stale. You know, we had vacation Bible school this week for the children. And uh, I was in San Diego for the last two weeks vacationing, me, me and lovely Cindy, and I was, I swim, ocean swim, and so I have trunks there, and they wanted me to film something uh, for the kids, and then when I showed up Friday, they wanted me to wear the same outfit. So on uh, uh, Wednesday, I swam in the ocean with my trunks, and then we got, we got in the car, and we left. They, they dried off with the sun, and then on Friday, I put them on, and then I, I'm, I'm walking around, and I'm in front of the kids, and every once in a while, I get a whiff of something. You, you know what I'm talking about, just kind of a, a whiff of something, and I'm thinking, whoa, what is that? It's like funky. It's like mildew. It's a bad odor, and, and then I kind of reach down, and I realize it was those swimming trunks. They had been in the ocean. They didn't get washed, and I put them on the next day. And that's sometimes the way our lives are. We're picking up things all around us. We pick up information from the news. We pick up uh, attitudes and spirits from our friendships and our jobs. Some are good and some are bad. And, 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 and sometimes it produces a bad odor, which represents now our outlook, our perspective, our disciplines and our habits. And uh, it, it's time for something new to take place in our lives. So I'm going to read a great scripture. It's found in Matthew, and we're going to launch this today. Matthew says this, Matthew 9. No one sews a patch. That's the word we're going to talk about, patchwork, patch. No one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, for the patch will pull away from the garment, making the tear worse. I want to talk about patchwork today. And I'm going to give you three points from that patchwork. But I want to talk about the word patch. Because he's saying here, none of us would have a new garment, like let's just say this brand new shirt, and just all of a sudden it tear, and all of a sudden I put a patch there. Because eventually it's going to affect the overallness of the shirt itself. And so today I want you to recognize uh, we've been doing a lot of patching in our lives today. 
patchwork, uh, or, or I'll say this, not another patch. We are always patching up our lives. People are patching up their problems. They're patching up relationships. They're patching up arguments. They're patching up disagreements, health, and finances. When shouldn't we patch something up and we just need to go new? We, we need to resolve some things rather than patch things up. Today, people are patching up the problems in their lives. They'll say, I'll patch it up with a vacation. I'll patch it up with alcohol. I'll patch it up with sex. I'll patch it up with working more. I'll, sp- I'll patch it up with shopping and spending money. I'll patch my, my problems and my hurt up with having an affair. I'll, I'll patch up my life by running away and just escaping to another state, another job, another relationship. I know I'll patch up all the hurts and the problems in my life. I'll go to a seminar and that will make it great. I'll start some positive thinking. I'll look at myself in the mirror and I'll say, you're an overcomer and you're a winner. People try to patch up the problems in their lives. I know I'm going to hire a professional coach. And yet all these things masquerade the problem that's in our lives. The reality is this. You cannot put a Band-Aid on a bullet wound. You cannot put Ben Gay on cancer. You cannot duct tape a broken fender and you cannot Windex your problems. You know, everybody wants to just patch it up with some duct tape. How long is the duct tape going to last? It it, it isn't going to last. And the Bible highlights that when we patch things up, it's only going to get worse. It's only going to get burst. It's going to get ruined and it will not be preserved. We're familiar with walls getting patched. We're familiar with tires getting patched. We're familiar with tubes getting patched. I mean, Lord Jesus, drive down your street, the highways, uh, you know, the freeways, and they're always doing patchwork on it. But it doesn't seem to resolve it. It just seems to have a temporary solution. And that's what I'm trying to tell you. If you and I are always trying to patch things up in our lives, rather than going new and fixing it and resolving it and changing in our lives, your patchwork, it doesn't last. When I was a little boy, it's a different world my generation would identify. You usually didn't have 15 pair of jeans and 15 different type of pants. For us, it was just a special occasion to buy a pair of blue jeans, 501 jeans, okay? But you go out and you wear them and and, and you play in them. And uh, for me, back in the day, my blue jets, which you called them, you would wear out the knees. You'd wear out the knees so that now all of a sudden you had holy pants and not, not sanctified godly. They'd just be rips in them. Today, they spend thousands of dollars on jeans or hundreds to rip them. But back in our day, we only had one. And so mama would get an, an iron-on patch that she'd sew, and she'd put a patch on your knees. Now today, that's really cool, but back in the day, uh, you, you didn't have an option, but it really, it, it, you were not, you were not pa- proud of your patches. Here's what I could tell you about when we patched our knees up and our, our pants. The patch never matched the pants. Come on, I'm preaching now. Somebody ought to say Amen. Uh, it was of different material. It, it, it felt different. It looked different. It didn't resolve the situation. And there comes a point in our lives where I've got to stop patching up what's going on and I need to resolve it and I need some newness in my life. With that in mind, here's what I'm going to tell you about patchwork. Here's the three words I want to give you. Patches are incapable or incompatible Patches are inferior and patches patches are incomplete. When you're going to try to patch up your life, then here's what you need to understand. It's incompatible. The patch is incompatible with the piece of garment. It's inferior to the piece of garment and it's incomplete to the wholeness of the garment. Here's the scripture I want to read you. It's found in 2 Timothy now. Incompatible. That's what I want to talk about. Today, what in your life is incompatible. What in your life today is non-compatible? It's a patch. It's non-compatible to the vision I have, to the dreams I have, to the goals I have, to the aspirations I have. I have these things in my life that are not compatible, and that's why I don't get the results I want. That's why I don't succeed. Well, here's what the Bible says. Uh, In 2 
in 2 Corinthians, please. 2 Corinthians. It says this. Do not be yoked together with unbelievers. For what does righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what does fellowship, what fellowship can light have with darkness? What harmony is there between Christ and Belial? That means the devil. Or what does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? And what agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will live in them, I will walk among them, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. He's talking about incompatibility in this text. And basically, the first thought is this. We need to pay attention to what we're bound to. The picture here is two animals bound by a wooden harness that will, uh, that will harvest the field or plow the field. So, so the, the Bible tells us we need to pay attention to that which we are yoked to, which means bound to, tied to, joined to, and hooked to. Why? Because what you are bound to will affect you. It will influence you and it will persuade you. And so we've got to be able to watch that because what we're bound to affects our mannerisms, affects our personality, affects our interests, affects our values, affects our thinking, affects our lordship. You ask yourself, how did I get where I'm at today? Because you're yoked up to something. And now has reproduced a mannerism, a thinking, and an attitude. Here's what I realize. What you are bound to eventually rubs off on you. It's going to rub off on you. In other words, here's what I'm saying. If today your yeses are yeses, then watch what you're yoked up to because your yes eventually could turn to a no. If you say no to some, I, I say no to this sin. I say no to uh, disobedience. I say no to lying. Then watch what you're yoked to because it can affect you and it can influence you. And the next thing you know, it's producing an opposite result in your life. You, you, you know what I'm talking about. Something that you would never do, you are now doing. Why? Because I'm yoked to movies I'm yoked to associations, I'm yoked to environments, and I'm yoked to thinking. How did I get to this? Because I'm not paying attention to what I'm yoked to, and I'm being incompatible with these things. With the God direction, the value, the things that God wants with my life, I've yoked up with things that are absolutely incompatible to the will of God in my life and to the direction of God in my life. In this scripture, you will see words like partnership, live, harmony, and union. And it will say this in this text we just read. What compatibility does righteousness have with wickedness? What compatibility does light have with darkness? What compatibility does Jesus have with the devil? What compatibility does a believer have with an unbeliever? He gives us five things here. And what compatibility does God's temple have to do with idols? They're not compatible. They're opposites. They compete against each other. You cannot mix and match. So again, I want to describe a thought to you today. How many of you, I, I don't know, have, have, have ever gotten, let's just say, lice in your life? You, you've gotten lice. Where does lice come from? It comes from someone else. How did it happen? I rubbed up on them. I don't know if you ever had, when I was a little kid, I had what they call scabies. It's this little bug. And uh, man, it just itches. And if you look real, you, you see it. It's like he's almost clear or white. And, and you see him. How did that happen? Well, I, I, I slept over my cousin's house. And, uh, we, you know, he didn't have, he didn't have a... Uh, 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 two beds so we slept we we're just little guys we slept together in the bed innocent but I so that's where the scabies came from because I rubbed rubbed off on it like that STD where does that rub off so so I I want you to I want to describe to you a, a greater thought today uh, and here's the thought Pay attention to the information source in your life. Pay attention to the relationships. Pay attention to your locations that you go. Pay attention to the opinion 
uh, that you are hearing from someone else. Pay attention to your social media intake. Pay attention to agendas that people have. Pay attention to lectures. Pay attention to literature. Pay attention to movies, award show, music. Pay attention to theme parks. Even pay attention to the mouse. They all have agendas and they will persuade you and you've got to make a point in your life and I'm not telling you what to do. What is not compatible to my faith? What's not compatible? I was watching a, one of these, you know, entertainment shows and a, a guy was celebrating having his umpteen kid with his, with his umpteen wife and they're just cheering for it. That's the way of the world. That's not compatible to my faith. And so am I just going to laugh it off? Am I going to spend two hours of my life absorbing this thing? Oh, Diego, you're just, you're, you're just going too far. Really? I am? It's not going to ever rub off on me. And my yes is going to become a no. And my no is going to become a yes. And, and what I resist now, I begin to tolerate and accept in my life. That's what's going on in this world. And that's why the Bible tells us, do not be conformed. Absolutely do not be conformed to this world. God told Abraham that Ur of the Chaldeans was not compatible. He had to leave Ur. God told Abraham that he was to separate from Lot because Lot was not compatible to him. And when a time, came, time came for Abraham to find a wife for Isaac, he was told, you are not to go find a wife from the Canaanite women but go back to our home people. And that has nothing to do with racism. It had to do with the faith. The faith. We don't want you to marry outside of the faith because it will affect the values. It will change your lifestyles and your mannerisms. And that's how huge that was. As kryptonite is to Superman, you have to ask yourself, what is my kryptonite that is not compatible to my faith? And for believers, it is sin, it's disobedience, it's worldliness and the works of darkness. Here's the second word I want to share with you. It's found in Deuteronomy, and I love this scripture. It's found in Deuteronomy, and it reads this in 22. Do not plant your vineyard with two types of seed. There's that incompatibility again. But today, now we're going to talk about inferior. Inferior. Do not plant two types of seeds. Righteous seeds and ungodly seeds. Bible, theology, and other beliefs. They're, they're, not, they're not compatible. They're inferior. He says, otherwise, otherwise the entire harvest, both the crop and what you plant and the produce of the vineyard will be defiled will be defiled. Today we have we believe as Christians that we can believe something and behave a different way. I just want to be holy right now so I'm going to go get me some church and then I could I just live like a junkyard dog alley cat garbage rat. It, it doesn't affect nothing. Really? That's what this scripture is saying. You can't plant two types of seeds because it's going to affect your harvest. And then I love this one. Watch this. Do not plow with an ox <laughs> And a donkey. Yeehaw! Together. Get the ass out of your life. Because it's affecting. See here's what you need right. The ox and the donkey are not the same. And we think they are. And they're not. They have different weights. They have different sizes. They have different production in their life. They get, they get different results. And you got to ask yourself, we're back to what you're yoked to. Am I, I'm the ox, but what's next to me? And maybe I'm not able to get the harvest and the results I want because I'm, I, I, I'm yoked with an ass in my life. Get all the ass out of me. Get all <laughs> Oh, wow. Didn't mean to say that. But you know what I'm talking about. You and I have got to recognize I've got to get all that's incompatible out of my life. And then I've got to get everything that's inferior out of my life. Because inferiorness will not al allow anything in my life to last, endure, and sustain. So what in, in your life today is inferior, not measuring up or able to come against the opposition? The donkey is inferior to the ox.
As much as you cannot mix silk with polyester, you cannot mix velvet with synthetic, and you can't mix satin with nylon. You cannot, I love this analogy, you cannot put a Ferrari engine in a Volkswagen Beetle. It, they're inferior to one another. A cubic zirconium and a diamond are inferior. Veneer and oak are inferior. I'm trying to go somewhere with this. What in my life is inferior? What in my life is incapable? And I can't allow that to be in. Uh, my mouth does not match up with my actions. My lifestyle doesn't match up with my behavior. Sunday going to church doesn't match up with how I go to work on, on, on Monday. Uh, how I live in front of my husband and how I live outside of, of, of the relationship. They don't match up. I'm two different type of people. I'm a Dr. Jekyll and I'm Mr. High. And it could be blatant or it could just be innocent. I say hallelujah, praise the Lord. But then I worry and then I'm fretful and then I'm fearful. I say I'm going to trust God. And the next thing I know, I'm full of gossiping and lying and cheating. It doesn't match up. You would never wear like a checkered shirt with striped pants. Come on now. Would you do that? And that's what he's saying when he talks about old wine, new wine, old skin, new wine. That's what he's talking about. A new cloth with an old skin. They just don't match up. It is absolutely inferior. You and I have to get all the inferior things out of us. We got to get inferior food out of us, inferior drink out of us, inferior language, inferior thoughts, inferior atmospheres, inferior environments, inferior habits and practices if we want great outcomes and superior results and performances in our lives. I have a friend of mine, he's in the automotive business. I went and saw his shop recently and he said, I'm remodeling uh, refurbishing this 1954 uh, truck. And he said, the guy's given me $100,000 to do it. So we're, we're going down to nuts and bolts, a, a, a rotisserie restoration on it with $100,000. And uh, he said, but the guy went on his own and he, he doesn't want to put this smaller engine that it came with. I don't even remember what it was, a, 283 or something like that size engine. He, wanted, he went and bought a 454, a big block engine. And he told my friend, I want to put this 454 in this uh, engine that used to have only 283 horsepower. And, and the guy said, I, 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 if I can't do it, but I can do it only if you pay me another $75,000. The guy said, why do I have to pay you another seventy? I bought the engine on my own. He said, what you don't understand is that this truck was not built for a 54 engine, horsepower. It was built for a 283 engine. If you want me to do that, I now have to recreate a structure. I have to recreate a frame that could sustain and carry the weight. Today, this world is in trouble. Everybody's going crazy. We are being bombarded on the left and right with all kinds of issues. Why are we breaking down? Because we don't have a frame and a structure to sustain the weight of what's coming against us. And so that's why we got to get back into the word. My son, attend to my words, incline thy ears unto thy sayings. Let them not depart from thy eyes. Keep them in the midst of thy heart. That's why 2 uh, uh, Timothy talks, 3.16, talks about all scripture is given uh, by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof. I need to be reproved. I need to be corrected. All of that's done through the word of God. Watch this next scripture. This is a really good scripture. Next one, please. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light into my path. The word, the word. We're driving the word of God here today. Next scripture. I love this one. He says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Next scripture, please. Last one. How can a young man cleanse his ways by taking heed according to the word? Man, it's the word of God that's going to help us today. 
It's the word of God that's going to make all the difference. It's not something we hold loosely. It, it, and I, thank God I just bought this brand new Bible. This is the first time I'm preaching. Man, you, you've got to get this into this. And then in, in here, it's got to be released in how I raise my kids. How do I talk to my kid? How do I talk to my wife? How, what do I put before my eyes? What do goes into my ears? How do I live? But if this is just held lightly or I rip out pages because I don't like it, then you and I are going to recognize we're trying to believe God for something great and it's never going to happen because we're putting on an old patch, which is your old habits, your old way of thinking, your old traditions, wanting some new results to take place in your life. And here's the last point, and you've been grace. So we talked about patchwork is absolutely incompatible. Patchwork is absolutely inferior. And here's the third word, patchwork brings incompleteness into your life. Here's a scripture in 2 Timothy 4 in verse number 7. Paul says this, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I've kept the faith. Keep it there, there. Let me ask you today, are you fighting a good fight? Number two, what, are you, what, what race are you supposed to finish? Right now the the world championship track and field is going on in Eugene, Oregon. <laughs> they, know what, they, they know what race they're supposed to be in. They know what lane they're supposed to be in. Nobody is taking them by the hand and say, we want you to be here at 250 and, 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 and we want you to warm. And we're going to help you to warm. Man, they're in a race. And this is a spiritual race. And you're supposed to finish your race. Finish. Finish being a Christian. He goes on, he says, I have kept the faith. So the reality is, as many people are not finishing their marriages, finishing parenting their children, finishing their dreams, their goals, finishing because of this thing called incompleteness. I want you to recognize what I'm talking about today. Because if you don't finish whatever God's called you to, you don't finish the tasks, the assignments, the callings, the mission, the purpose that God has called you to, then I want you, there's no rewards for, for showing up. You've got to finish. There, there's no example and model for the next generation. I'm inspired when I see someone finish something. I'm not inspired. It's just harder for me if I have no exampleship. You have to finish for your children and for your grandchildren so that they could see one man and one woman staying married together for a lifetime so that when the threat of divorce or separation or not getting along comes in their lives, they'll finish Finishing inspires and motivates and brings conviction to those that won't finish. And finish brings such joy and peace and security. That's why you need to finish. So I want to challenge you today. In spite of the losses, let's put some practicality. I failed, pastor. I'm miserable. I, I have regrets. I have shame. I have guilt. That's okay. In spite of your losses, I still need you to start today. Now finish your vows. Now finish your commitments. Now finish your promises to God. It's never too late to be what you might have been. Let me give you this great quote. It, it reads like this. It's not how you start the race. It's how you finish the race. You, you guys are athletic guys. You've seen a team that is being beaten by halftime. Then they come back and win track and field you've seen somebody running off the pace and man they start kicking it the last whatever 150 yards boom they win the race you've seen a fighter or someone else where the odds are stacked against them they're like a million and one to win but they win so I, i'm trying to tell you today i don't know what you've done in the past but i know what you could do in the future i don't know where you have messed up and you failed and you're dealing with the shame but start today and start finishing, finishing. A lot of people are not finishing today. They don't pick up their Bible anymore. They don't tithe and are not generous financially. They're not serving no more. They're not witnessing anymore. Some people uh, uh, just, re just decide they're not going to come to church. And I'm not saying anything wrong with watching it online. But I can't have community online. Where am I serving online? 
uh, there comes a point when I got to challenge myself. I got to get back to whatever getting back is. And I, I got to finish. I got, I got a short time to finish. On this vacation, uh, I'm, I'm finishing now. Uh, on this vacation, we always take some grandchildren with us to bond uh, with us. And so we took a few of them and, and, and Silas. I took Silas, young Silas. And you'll see a picture of Silas. I, that's him. I, I, me and him went surfing. And this is Silas. Me and him went surfing. But Silas went into the water one minute. It was like an hour and a half surfing lesson. But the first minute, the water was cold and he started shaking. He only went to his knees. He wouldn't go any further. Then the, the way he didn't realize, the wave came and crashed against him and it made him flush. Then as he began to get in the water, he swallowed water. And man, his flesh, face was beet red. He was coughing. He was choking. I mean, he was shaking. His face was red. And, and I wasn't sure what to do. And I, I was about ready to walk up to him and say, I'm so proud of you for be coming out here. And I'm so proud of you for trying. Do you know that boy, in spite of his fears, in spite of his doubts, in, in, in spite of the, the, the trouble in his life, he finished the lesson an hour and a half. And that's why you see, at the end of it, the dude is surfing. What are you saying you can't do because of all the opposition? Fight through and have the courage to get on that board no matter what resists against you. The next day he said, Grandpa, when are we going surfing again? Ah, I love it. I love it. Three things that we learned today. You and I cannot be patching up our lives, patching up our problems. They're temporary. They won't fix. Patches are incompatible. Patches are inferior. And patches are incomplete. We can't live that way. I want to come on over here and I want to end with this little illustration. But as I'm coming over here, here are words that are coming on the screen that I want to give you of how we are to overcome the incompleteness in our lives, the incompatibility, inferior. The words like this, like this. Pray. Start praying now. Love. Forgive. Obey. Ask. Hang around newness. Repent. Change. Start. All these things are what we're talking about will help us. I'm going to build a sandwich right now. I got some sourdough bread. Some, some, what used to, used to be my favorite. So let's do this. How many of you, how many of you like mayo? How many of you like mayo on your sandwich? So we'll put some mayo on there. How many of you like uh, Dijon mustard? How many of you are mustard people? We'll put some mustard on that. Okay. How many of you like ketchup? Okay. Don't know if people like ketchup or not, but we're going to put, we're going to put some ketchup on there like that. Okay. Great. How many of you like your salami? How many of you like salami on there? We're going to put some salami. How many of you like some ham? We're going to build this thing. with mm, build the ham. Okay. How many of you like turkey? We're going to put some, we're going to put some turkey on there. Great. How many of you like your, your cheese? We're going to put a couple slices of Swiss cheese. How about tomato? I don't know. Some people now are finicky about tomato. Okay, that looks pretty good. How many of you, how many of you like, uh, how many of you like whipped cream on your sandwich? You like that? Okay, that's good. How many of you like, how many of you like ice cream? Let's throw some ice cream on there. Some ice cream on there. How many of you like, how many of you like sardines? Let's throw some sardines on there, okay? Some sardines, that's great. How many of you like your, how many of you like your collard greens on there? Let's, let's just put some collard greens on there, okay? And, and then I, I went out and I, I got some of my um, Fluffy's uh, poop, and we're going to put a scoop of her poop on there, right there. Okay, isn't that wonderful? Isn't that wonderful, Doug? Just a triple-decker sandwich. Okay, how many of you want the first bite? Why? Why don't you want to eat it? You said you liked the cheese. You said you liked the ham. You said you liked the salami. What's wrong with the turkey? You asked for the mustard in the mail. Oh, wait a minute. I know. It's the poop. It's the, it's, it's the sardines. It's the whipped cream. I'm asking you today. You would not tolerate eating this sandwich but you'll tolerate sins in our lives. We'll tolerate compromises in our lives. We'll tolerate disobedience in our lives. You know what? We'll date people that are not Christians. We'll say it's okay. We'll watch movies that, that, that have a lot of nudity in it. 
We watch award shows because we want to support this and it's nothing but profanity and it's nothing but, uh, uh, you know, degrading of women. What, what is that? That's your salami and that's your poop together. You would never do that. Why, why, why will you eat what's going on around us and not think that it won't affect what goes in, comes out? Today, let's make sure that we, our belief matches our behavior. Our belief matches our behavior. They're not contradictory to each other. Let's not just be a Christian by title, by checking the box. Let's not just be a Christian because we have a beautiful 24 karat cross around it. Let's just not be a Christian because I, I got a tattoo. Let me not just be Christian because I got a fish bumper sticker. Let me be a Christian, Christ-like, in all areas of my life. Father, I thank you for this message and I, I just pray, Lord, that we begin to take inventory of what's incompatible in our lives to our faith, what's inferior to our faith, and what brings an incompleteness to our faith. And we ask you to forgive us and may we have the courage to change. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, I want to thank you for watching. I want to thank you for listening. I want to thank you for your faithfulness today to uh, walk with us with this journey. Thank you for investing in yourself today. But nowhere in the Bible does it say if you don't cuss and you drink and, you know, if you're highly spiritual and you do this or you do that, you'll go to heaven. Those are called works. And you cannot work your way out of hell and you cannot work your way into heaven. The work of the cross was the final work. That's why Jesus, when he hung on the cross, he said, it is finished. That's why when Jesus died, the veil of the temple was ripped in half from the top to bottom, signifying that, 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 that God would not use man in, 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 in any way to influence who God was in relationship to Jesus, in relationship to salvation or coming into the presence of God. It would only be done through Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man goes to the Father but by me. The Bible says there's no salvation in any other person but Jesus Christ. Today, he's the only one that loved you enough to die for you. He was the only one that could abolish and forgive you of your sins. He's the only one that could change your destiny from eternal damnation and hell to everlasting life. And he's the only one that loves you unconditionally. He'll let you choose whether you accept him or not. He'll let you choose the lifestyle you choose to live or not. He loves you enough to give you a free will. But today I want you to recognize one day in all our glory, in all our splendor, in all our fans, in all our followers, it's gonna end at that point. What is going to matter the most is where you're going and have you made your peace with God. Don't wait for that to happen because sometimes it's not afforded to us a time or a second chance to do that. You give your life to Jesus Christ right now or do you rededicate your life to the Lord. It'll be the best decision you've ever made. Say this, dear Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. I ask you to come and live in my heart. Forgive me of my sins. I thank you today that I'm born again. I'm a child of God. I want to live for you now in Jesus' name. You're forgiven, and I want to just thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you next week. God bless you.